Well, the Lee County Board of County Commissioners zoning hearing will convene if we could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. We're going to ask uh, Mr. Rodriguez to introduce the item, and then there will be some uh, procedural comments from the County Attorney's Office. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Anthony Rodriguez, Principal Planner with the Zoning Section of the Department of Community Development. Our case this morning is Port Sanibel Marina. This is DCI 2016-00019 slash RFR 2019-00001. This is a request for relief pursuant to section 70.51 of Florida statutes. Before we get into the staff presentation on the details of the case and the request, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Mr. Adams from the County Attorney's Office, who's gonna give a bit of a procedural background on how we got here today. Morning, commissioners. Uh, the special magistrate process is an informal mediation process, uh, meaning it's not quasi-judicial in nature. Uh, it's also open to public comment. Uh, in this case, the applicant's rezoning request was denied by the board, and, and through this process, the request was uh, modified and codified into the special magistrate's recommendation. That recommendation was considered by you all in February. Uh, in February, the board found that the changes made to the original request uh, did not adequately address the inconsistencies with the LEAP plan. Um, since then, and at, at that point, the case was continued to today. Um, since then, the applicant has made further modifications to the request to deal with compatibility issues. Um, that's what's going to be considered by the board. At this point, staff is going to give the board an overview of the case and uh, prevent, present the staff's recommendation, followed by the applicant followed by public participation. So, if there's any questions, I have to answer them. Any questions? Thank you. I have one question. Just looking ahead, uh, not, not trying to anticipate an, any particular outcome here, but if we should uh, fail to uh, approve this amended request today that came to us, came to us from the special magistrate, what options are available to the applicant? Uh, the applicant could then either file a lawsuit uh, based on the original request not <coughs> presented today, um, or they could file a new application and go through the entire process again. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from the applicant. Okay, so. <clears throat> Mr. Adams kind of gave a bit of a background, but here's a, a bit of a timeline to acclimate you to how we got here today. This case was first heard at the HEX in Jan uh, July of 2017, and the HEX at that time recommended approval with conditions and deviations. The board considered the HEX recommendation at the, at the November 8, 2017 board hearing, and at that point requested that the case be remanded back to the hearing examiner for additional evidence and testimony. The second HEX hearing was held on April 26th, and 2018 and concluded in September of 2018. And again, the HEX recommended a recom HEX issued a, recommended of, a recommendation of approval with conditions and deviations. At the second hearing in August of 2019, the board denied this case as was referenced by Mr. Adams. The applicant submitted the request for relief in September of 2019. The special magistrate hearing occurred in December of 2019 with the recommendation of adoption of a resolution approving the applicant's modified request. And in February of 2020, the board continued the case to allow for time for the applicant to make additional modifications beyond the consent recommendation issued by the special magistrate. Just by way of background for, regarding the basis for denial, the basis for denial referenced uh, concerns related to con compatibility with existing residential uses in the surrounding area. It also referenced specific um, lack of compliance with Lee Plan Policy 5.1.5 regarding the protection of residential communities from the encroachment of commercial uses that may be potentially destructive to the residential environment, and also Lee Plan Policy 6.1.3 regarding the cohesive integration of commercial uses into 
um, surrounding areas. In addition, the board found that the request would necessitate a more intense use of Port Comfort Road. Specifically, there was a boat, a boat crossing um, proposed from north to south across Port Comfort Road, uh, which the board found is not appropriate at the subject location. And the board also found that the recommended conditions and other applicable recommend regulations, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, failed to provide sufficient safeguard to the public interest. Since that time, through the special magistrate process, the applicant has made specific modifications to the request. In particular, the applicant has eliminated the Port Comfort Road crossing and thereby has also eliminated the second boat launch across well, on the south side of Port Comfort Road, the exterior door that was facing Port Comfort Road, and also has proposed new buffer enhancements around the proposed dry storage building on dry boat storage building on the north side of Port Comfort Road to allow for an enhanced compatibility uh, along that roadway. The applicant has also proposed to reduce the number of slips from 179 slips to 144 slips. That's the, uh, sorry, the, the dry boat storage slips from 179 to 144. And the total number of slips will be reduced from 385 slips to 352 slips. The length of the uh, dry boat storage building is being decreased from 348 feet to 292 feet. And the height of the new dry storage building is being proposed to be increased from 43 feet to 45 feet. Might be a little bit difficult to see on your screens, but here is the previously requested master concept plan on your left-hand side and the updated master concept plan on the right-hand side. This is the location of the boat crossing. And the, as you can see here, the boat crossing is being eliminated. And I've also, uh, there's a blow up here on the second page. Um, the boat crossing on your left-hand side is now proposed to be eliminated. So with all that, the staff recommended, the recommendation notes that the additional changes made by the applicant appear to address the concerns that were previously raised by the board. The proposed changes do bring the proposed development further into compliance with the goals, objectives, and policies of the LEAP plan, specifically policies 5.1.5 and 6.1.3, which were discussed as the basis for denial. And staff does recommend approval of the commercial plan development amendment as, a, as amended by the request for relief process under section 70.51 Florida statutes. Um, staff is here to answer any questions you might have. Otherwise, um, the applicant is here as well. Any questions for staff? Any questions? Anthony, so with the reduction of the boat crossing now, where the boats that would normally be crossed to the other side of the road for going into the water, will they be dropped on the basically the north end of the building if you're facing the building to the left side? Is that where the boats are going to be launched at there in that waterway there? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Seeing none, we'll hear from the applicant. All right, good morning. For the record, my name is Beverly Grady with Rutton Andrus, and I am pleased to be representing Roberts Development Corporation and Go Fund in the Sun LLC. And we are pleased to present our major and substantial modifications to this request for Port Sanibel Marina since the board's last hearing in February 19th, 2020. Here today with us is our consulting team, Lisa Bram uh, from RLR JD Minor. He's the general manager of the marina, can answer any operational questions. Paula McGeico, our expert in planning. Uh, Charlie Krebs, professional engineer, familiar with the land development code. Hans Wilson, professional engineer, expert in coastal planning, plan marinas, uh, anything to deal with docks, shorelines. Tyler Peterson is an architect and here to ask, answer any questions regarding the design. Ted Trish, TR, TR Transportation, and Bill Pricey is our landscape architect. Our request is to amend an existing commercial plan development 
and to change the 50 unit approved hotel motel at a height of 75 feet, six stories over parking to a second boat dry storage facility at the existing marina. We believe it's important this new boat storage facility will contain 144 slips. However, the net increase due to our reduction at the marina is 118 dry slips. Today, we have 133 slips, and if this request is approved, we will have 251 <coughs> dry slips. That's a net increase of 118 slips. How are they allocated? There are 107 in the existing dry storage building and 26 that are outside, which are eliminated. And then we have 144 in the new boat storage facility for a net increase of 118 even less than what is existing today in the site. So we find that to be a major modification. We have slides on the timeline too. I will not, I will not review that because Anthony has covered that, but we will provide our PowerPoint. What we do, what we will present today is how these modifications have addressed your denial from August 2019 and then your further request for a further reduction in intensity, which was addressed by reduction in the number of dry slips and a reduction in the size of the proposed dry storage building, uh, which will be reviewed and additional separation between the two buildings. <clears throat> We would request that at the conclusion of public comment that we would have an opportunity to respond and to clarify. We do appreciate staff in the county attorney's office. We've had a number of communications with residents of County Mac Island, have not reached a consensus, uh, but it was very helpful and we do appreciate that the county attorney's office and staff assisted with that. And it, it, it helped establish some clear communication, but we would like that opportunity to clarify anything that's stated as an existing concern. And now I would like to introduce Paula McMichaels uh, to present to you brief history, but the changes that we've made and dwell on the changes we've made since the February 2020 hearing and we'll be requesting your approval. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, my name is Paula McMichael. I'm the Director of Planning with Hull Montez. I'm going to do a brief uh, presentation of the changes that have been made. It'll take me about 10 or 15 minutes. So first, I just wanted to orient you to the site. So this is the Port Sanibel Marina. We have the Caloosahatchee River to the north. Um, you can go out to the channel to San Carlos Bay, the Gulf of Mexico. We have the island of Sanibel and Fort Myers Beach. So the next slide takes you a little bit closer into the site. So the marina is located on the north side of McGregor Boulevard. It's a little less than a mile and a half from the base of the Sanibel Causeway. And taking you in a little bit closer still. Again, the marina is on the north side of McGregor Boulevard. It's bisected by Port Comfort Road. So the existing development on the site, starting down here, this is the Lighthouse Restaurant. We have docks. Parking for the docks, there's a public boat ramp. This is the bridge over to Jonathan Harbor. We have covered docks on the north side of Port Comfort Road, an existing dry boat storage facility. And then this is the area that we're talking about. It's currently vacant, it's used for boat trailer parking, um, but it's approved for construction of a 50 room, 75 foot, six stories over parking hotel. This is the zoning of the marina, which is a commercial plan development. The property was rezoned from Ag 2 and C2, which is a commercial zoning district in 1999, so over 20 years ago. The property has been used as a marina since at least 1944, based on aerial evidence. So you can see the docks on the north side of the bridge going over to Connie Mac Island. So the existing approved development parameters um, again, this was approved as a commercial plan development back in 1999. So about six acres of the site is placed into a conservation easement. There are 99 wet slips. There's a boat ramp, about a 6,000 square foot restaurant with cocktail lounge, 900 square feet of retail, 
1,500 square feet of boat sales in office. There's 133 dry boat storage slips existing today in a building that's a maximum height of 43 feet. And again, a 50 unit hotel motel was approved at a maximum height of 75 feet, six stories over parking. So this is the approved master concept plan. So again, you can see Port Comfort Road, restaurant, docks, the public boat ramp, the existing dry boat storage facility, and then this was the approved hotel. And this area in green is the conservation easement. So the hotel was approved with a zero foot setback from the right of way um, for an elevated port cochere. Uh, so the lobby was on basically the second floor. So you would drive up over a port cochere to get into the lobby. So the proposed development will maintain all of the existing parameters except for the addition of two staging slips for, to accommodate the additional dry boat storage slips, changing the permitted dry boat slips from 133 to 251, which is an increase of 118 slips. And again, we're removing the 50 room hotel motel. So this just shows that same information side by side. So again, we're getting rid of 50 hotel rooms. We're adding two wet slips and 118 dry slips. So as Beverly already covered, the request before you is to amend the commercial plan development to change the approved 50 unit hotel motel at six stories over parking 75 feet to an additional dry boat storage facility with 144 storage slips at a maximum height of 45 feet. This was the master concept plan that the board reviewed back in August of last year. So at that time we were proposing 175 slips in this building and the boats were going to be launched on the south side of Port Comfort Road. So there was a new boat launch here and the boat crossing. After that hearing, we removed the boat crossing and the second boat launch and reduced the length of the building from 348 feet to 319 feet. And this is the master concept plan that was presented to the board in February. So again, we removed the crossing of Port Comfort Road, the boat launch, the building length was reduced by about 8%. And all of the boats from the new building will be launched at the existing boat launch on the north side of Port Comfort Road. The reduced length of the building allowed us to add six additional parking spaces on the east side of the building. And based on concerns that we heard at the hearing in February, uh, the length of the building has been reduced further by 27 feet and the number of boat slips has been reduced further to 144. Uh, so again, the old building was approved for 133 slips, which we reduced to 107. So the request is 107 slips within this building, 144 in the new building for a total of 251 dry slips. So this is the current master concept plan. Again, the length of the building has been reduced to 292 feet, which is consistent with the length of the hotel that's approved for the site, which was approved at 289 feet as well as the depth of the hotel. So this building at the deepest point is 118 feet. The hotel was 127 feet. We've added additional green space, which you're, you're seeing here between the two buildings. And there's 200 feet between the buildings at this point. We've also added additional landscaping um, on the east side of the building as well. And again, all of the boats, as indicated by the red arrow, will be launched at the existing boat launch. So as stated at the beginning, the height has changed by two feet from 43 feet to 45 feet. The additional height is at the back of the building. So it steps back in height from the setback. It goes up about 15 feet in about 13 to 14 feet, and then goes up another eight or nine feet um, to the highest point of the building. So the slight increase in height will not be noticeable for users of Port Comfort Road. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Can, can we go back to the previous uh, slide before this one? There you go. Um, from remembering from the last hearing that we had, a couple of the real concerns that I had um, and that the residents voiced was the uh, overflow parking from the restaurant. Um, could you show me on this plan how you all have addressed the overflow parking from the restaurant? Um, 
we've added, based from the existing site to this site, we've added 77 parking spaces. So I believe there are 26 parking spaces here, so that will accommodate additional parking from the hotel, from the hotel, from the restaurant. Um, and I do have a slide that goes through the required parking for each use if you'd like me to review that. Excellent. Okay. And then one other question I had too, just because this is a great overview of what the whole site looks like. Um, another concern that the residents had that um, I was also concerned about was the, um, the areas where people will stop and take care of their trailers. Uh, a lot of times it looked like there were great pictures of people stopping on the road. Is there a trailer staging or preparation area that you all have uh, taken into account here? So th there are a couple things um, that should alleviate that. One is that we're adding 10 trailer spaces within this parking lot. So right now there are no truck and trailer spaces available in this parking lot, so we're adding 10. Um, the other thing, with the, with the development of this vacant parcel, there will no longer be that trailer storage there. So people will not be able to store their trailers there. Um, so that will reduce, reduce that activity. Okay, thank you for answering those questions. Um, so again, this shows the additional two feet in height. So this was the previous um, facade at 43 feet, and this is the 45 feet. So you can see the additional two feet in height has been pushed back to the back of the building. Okay. All right. uh, so the next two slides just summarize all the changes that have been made. Again, we've eliminated the crossing. We've eliminated the second boat launch. Um, so the underline is what's changed for this hearing. So again, we've reduced the number of slips to 144 slips with a net increase of only 118. Um, we re removed the exterior door facing Fort Comfort Road. There's no need for a door there because there's no crossing. We've reduced the length of the new building to 292 feet, which is consistent with the length of the building for the approved hotel motel. We're providing 21 parking spaces over code minimum. And again, I can review in more detail if you'd like me to at the end. We've increased the separation between the two buildings um, by an additional 27 feet. Uh, we've increased the height slightly, but again, that's on the back of the building and we're increasing the landscaping on the east side of the new building. So now I want to respond to the findings and conclusions of the zoning resolution of August of 2019, which were concerned with compatibility with the existing residential uses, which are located across the bridge on a separate island to the north. Based on the LEED plan and the LEED land development code, it is my professional expert opinion that based upon the modifications that we've just presented, this application is consistent with the LEED plan in particular, but not limited to LEED plan policies 5.1.5 and 6.1.3. Based upon these modifications, it is my professional opinion that the elimination of the Port Comfort Road crossing has resolved the concern regarding potential disruption of the roadway and negative impacts on surrounding land uses. In my professional opinion, based upon these modifications, the application as presented is consistent with and supported by the policies on this slide. I'm looking at the consistency with the land development code. In my expert opinion, the request as modified is consistent with the criteria in the LDC, which including 34145 and 34411, which relates to plan developments. We've recommended conditions that provide sufficient safeguards to protect the public interest, and that the requested deviations as conditioned enhance the achievement of the objective of the plan development to expand water access to the public and will not cause a detriment to the public interest, consistent with 34373. In summary, the applicant has demonstrated compliance with the LEAP plan, with the LDC, and with all other codes and regulations. So the final slides I wanted to review are the revised renderings of the buildings, which again dem demonstrate the additional two feet in height at the back of the building. Again, it's a wedding cake, it's a tiered design, so the height at the setback is about uh, 10 or 12 feet lower than the, the eave height. And you can see all the architectural embellishments that have been added to the building, as well as the landscaping, which will match the existing landscaping with the existing building. So this is the view driving in Port Comfort Road, the building on the north side, 
And again, we've added additional landscaping in this corner to again soften that view as you're driving in along Port Comfort Road. And that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? I just asked for one question. Can you turn to page 31 to directly answer Commissioner Hammond's question on the parking? Because mm -hmm. we did a lot of work on responding to that question. Yes. So I'll start here. This is the, the parking demand per the land development code. So how many parking spaces are required based on the uses that are on the site. So again, we have the bait and tackle store, which requires about three spaces, the wet slips, 49 spaces, the restaurant, um, you can see requires 81 spaces. And then the existing dry boat storage, 21 spaces, the boat ramp, that's the 10 truck and trailer spaces. The new building requires 29 spaces. And then we have charter boats um, that also have parking requirements. So this shows where all of those parking, required parking, are located on the site. So the restaurant, sort of the salmon color. So you can see all of the restaurant parking spaces are accommodated on the restaurant site. We have the cocktail lounge, boat sales, and charter boat parking spaces. I'm looking at that, that green color, and I don't see that green color up there. I think this, this is this color. I apologize. Adventures in Paradise, the charter boats, 33 spaces. So we see we've, we've located them there, but obviously you can park at the restaurant, you can park here as well as there. There's nothing that would stop you from doing that. So the marina, the dockage at the marina, so that's this color. Um, the proposed dry boat storage facility, these are the spaces for that building. And then the parking for the existing building is sort of this light purple color. And then the parking that we're providing over the code minimum, which again is 21 spaces, um, is in the, the light yellow color. So again, all of the uses on the site are accommodated in the parking. <coughs> yes. Um, so we know there was some concern from the, from the public because as you can see, sometimes people park here. Um, they're, they're not parking there because there's no place else to park. Um, they're parking there for convenience. Uh, maybe they've got their, their boat trailer over here, so they're parking here. But you can see there's plenty of parking available throughout the site. So that's not why people are parking there. Um, so again, it, it may, as you're driving along Fort Comfort Road and you're seeing people parking there, that may make you think that there's a parking problem. Uh, but there is plenty of parking available throughout the site. So we just pulled um, images from Google Earth from the last four years, and they all show the same thing, that there's plenty of parking throughout the site. And we had also done a parking demand study um, that showed that the actual demand for the entire site was 184 spaces. And that was based on our original proposal for 179 slips. So with this reduction to 144 slips, um, again, based on that parking demand study, there is plenty of parking throughout the site. Chairman, I have a question. Sure. Um, I have a question about the parking lot. Would it be the county attorney or admin? Kind of both in a way because it comes back to code enforcement. So if this was approved, uh, there's obviously a currently a parking problem now. We've seen pictures of it in evidence. We've heard the testimony. We've seen pictures of the parking issues. So if it continues on, I guess that would be up to the residents to summon, the, like for example, the sheriff's department since the public road to respond to that or would it come back to a zoning issue? I mean, we currently have the issue now with some businesses where have been approved in the past where now is a zoning issue. It's a violation of noise ordinance, for example. Um, so the problem is trying to get compliance with code enforcement or law enforcement after it's already occurred, which was already built and the problems are current. Um, so would it be up to res the residents to 
have an off-duty detail or contact the Sheriff's Department daily when this parking problem happens where people are blocking the roadway. So that's questions to our county staff that as far as code enforcement or the county attorney wants to respond to. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm going to look to Michael to see. If, if there's parking on the right-of-way or within the right-of-way that you're correct, the residents will need to uh, or anyone who is affected by that needs to call the sheriff's office and, and have that issue addressed. Uh, from the standpoint of the actual parking requirements, uh, that is something that's addressed through the development order stage, and they will be required to demonstrate that they actually meet the code requirements. And in fact, in this particular case, they're, requ they're actually going to be required to put more spaces in than what the code is actually required. Okay. So basically, they have to tell the residents to contact law enforcement to enforce people parking on the roadway or pulling off the side of the road on the right of way and stuff like Correct. that. Okay, great. Thank you. And I think this is important. This shows the existing dry storage building, the existing landscaping and sidewalk. There is never any parking in along that existing building. If the new boat storage building is approved, it will we're replicating this. We're also we've reduced uses and we have 21 more spaces than the code requires, which is a change from the beginning. But also with the landscaping, as you see it, that doesn't that's not going to provide and that is not used for parking. And we're going to be replicating that. So we think that's an additional insurance to respond to your question in addition to what Mr. Jacobs said. So what I was referring to like Beverly, like you go out on Saturday morning at eight o'clock and there'd be trucks stopping before they get there with trailers, with boats or without boats, and they'll be stopping, getting tackle, getting ropes, doing stuff like that. So it's not a parking issue, it's a driver's issue that decides they don't want to pull in the parking lot or get to the, the marina yet, they decide to stop and do this on their own. So that's the, the problem that occurs now. And, and of course we are reducing the number of uses of the boat ramp in that there will be the 10 parking spaces that are now provided in the parking lot shown by Ms. McMichael. So there will be a reduced number of uh, boats that can use that. So that will reduce the issue of boats backing into the boat ramp. And, and that's really up to the board um, also if you want that to continue use as, a, as the public boat ramp and you can determine intensity, you limit it to 10 trailer spaces, that will limit the intensity compared to what the opportunity is today. Thank you. Any other questions? You know, I, I do have one, one just, just to ask, just because I'm, I'm interested in, um, would, uh, would installing some curbing along the edge of the road prevent people from pulling over on the grass and parking there? I mean, I, I kind of wondered about got a six inch or whatever tall curb you're not going to pull your boat and trailer up over on top of that um, I would have to defer to our, our site engineer I, I, I don't know if it would be possible to put curbing in there based on the roadway I don't know if our county regulations allow for that too, but I mean that, that would be that would be one way to really direct people where to park. If you wanted to put a big curb in there, they couldn't pull over and just park on the grass. Then we need, DOT needs to since it's a county road, DOT would need to be involved. Okay, yeah, that's that's what I was wondering. Yeah, we, yeah. operationally, we would be okay with any recommendations you would make that would meet you know the requirements um, with the um, proposed development. Um, our belief is by having the 10 truck and trailer staging areas, that, as you had referenced earlier, that the prep work that um, Commissioner Pendergrass had referenced, where they're coming out, they're taking their straps off of the trailer, sitting alongside of Port Comfort, you know, that their truck may be running, but that could pretend, pose the risk of someone having to drive around that vehicle. They, all that prep work would be done in those staging areas. They come in, they, they stage there. They pay for their parking for the day. They're given their receipt. They have their, their slip that they're assigned to. They do all their prep work. They launch their boat. They park back in that spot. When they come back, they back down the ramp. They pick their boat up, go back in there. Their hose is not too far. They can flush their motor, do all the work they need to do from, from that spot in that designated parking that currently does not exist. The other thing that we think you know, will greatly um, assist in this is you know, we're, we're at 157 boats on our waiting list. 
a lot of those customers utilize our ramp. So having that ability to store their boats, not having to trailer their boat, will just by default reduce the amount of activity. So between providing designated spaces and the storage will reduce that. But again, we're all open to if we have to do curbing, anything like that, we're constantly, you know, we, we stay on top of it. Um, where we're, we're asking people, you know, don't park on the side of the road, we relocate them, but they are currently parking down in the parcel that we're trying to develop once they're, once they're done. Um, however, again, with these um, improvements, that will impact it significantly. Okay. That answers my question. Thanks, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. And Mr. Chair, if I could just add, I mean, the, the curbing would be in the county's right of way and would need to be evaluated for drainage and other potential issues. So as Mr. Jacobs indicated, we, DOT would be involved in that. Okay. Just asking. Mr. Chairman, I would have one last question if we could let the lady back. And could you bring up uh, again the overhead that Commissioner Hammond was referring to <coughs> that shows the new building and traffic patterns? Well, well, it will there. Now, the new building, it's, it's, this is over, I need you to oversimplify this whole thing for me so I understand the new building is designed to hold boats, right? And they, they, the boats are put in there with these giant forklifts that'll lift a two-ton boat and move it around. How does it get in and out of the new building? I'm wondering about competition on the main road. How, give me an example. Show me you're going to get help on this. So the door for the new building. I want to know where that big forklift comes from and goes to, and does it compete with the road? Okay. At no point moving a boat would that um, forklift ever come in any proximity of Port Comfort Road. It's going to be operating. All the boats are on that northeast side of Port Comfort Road. So that, that forklift will operate between the existing facility, the cross-through, and the proposed facility. So at no point would it become. You can use the mouse for the pointer there. Oh, uh -huh. yes, sir. So it's going to just, so the operating path of that forklift is here and here. That's what I wanted to see. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Go to public comment. Um, Peter Annis. Mr. Chair, if you'll permit me, I'd just like to remind all of the speakers making public comment that they're allowed five minutes today. We've got a green, yellow, and red stoplight system here, so when they see the yellow light come on, they need to start wrapping up because in order to be fair to all of the speakers, you know, we only allow five minutes for each, and that uh, please refrain from um, demonstrations of approval or disapproval just to keep things fair. Thank you. Quite a few cards, so I'm really going to have you adhere to the five-minute rule. But Peter Ennis. How many got? How many cards you got? 30. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm here uh, on request of uh, J.D. Miner um, <clears throat> and the proposed uh, Port Sanibel Marina waterfront uh, the access to the water. Um, me personally, um, I've lived in Lee County about 30 years and um, I own two businesses on the water, one in St. James City and uh, we just, uh, <clears throat> my partners and I opened a restaurant on Fort Myers Beach called the Snug Harbor. Um, kind of terrible timing with COVID and everything else but one thing that um, we've learned is water has become very popular. Anything outdoor, recreational, so um, myself, my partners, um, friends, we're in support of anything um, to do with more outdoor activity and obviously with uh, having restaurants on the water, um, I've been here a couple times to uh, help JD out here and just try to, you know, from a business side, it's, it's real important to have, uh, to have access to the water. Um, beaches and the water are, are, you know, one of our biggest assets here in southwest Florida and um, I just think it's real important to give people an opportunity. I've lived in Estero for about 20 years, 
and a long ways from the water, but friends, neighbors still have boats, still want to have access to get to water, and here's a great opportunity with someone who sounds like they're uh, making a lot of concessions and trying to do the right thing they can um, to make everyone happy um, in the area and to make a beautiful facility. Um, Lee County is growing and growing, but um, you know the waterfront, you know, water's not growing. So, um, you know, I'm all all for uh, this uh, per, um, this project going forward, and um, I think they've done a great job. Um, facilitating everything that uh, everyone's asked them to do. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Cody Lou John. Cody. Good morning, guys. Um, I'm a local boater in the area, and uh, just hearing everything about uh, the development and everything, I think uh, one thing to bring up is how convenient the marina is to every single waterway that you have in, in the bay here. You've got inc instant access to the Matlache Pass, uh, the Caloosahatchee River, the San Carlos Bay, Estero Island, the Gulf of Mexico. So as you can probably tell, it's a highly coveted you know, area to keep your boat in. Um, I think that there is definitely something that is needed, such as boat storage in an area like this. Um, you know, it's, it's a nice area. It's, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's heavily populated, but Punarasa boat ramp, uh, it's, it gets a lot of overflow. Um, so people naturally come to us and uh, when, you know, they hear about the marina, they want to keep their boat there. And uh, like Mr. JD just said, you know, I think they have a lot of boats on their wedding list. And, uh, you know, by adding that, it's, it's going to relieve a lot of... Uh, or it's going gonna, it's gonna to help a lot with uh, boat storage. And it's something that is in very high demand that there's not enough supply of. So, you know, just as a boater, I think it's a really good idea to add more boat space. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Abraham. Joseph Abraham. Good morning. My name is Joe Abraham. I'm the president of ABC Electric here in Fort Myers. Have been for 40 years. I participated in this renovation of this building. Very proud of it. The uh, little table out there at the door was donated by my wife from her antique business, which was downtown Fort Myers here. That back then. Um, overall, I have been a boat person all my life since I was a child. Uh, lived on Lake Ontario, lived on Sanibel Island, lived on the Back Bay, lived on the river, and live on a pond now in North Fort Myers because <laughs> my wife's a horse person, so she convinced me that was where we ought to be. Port Sanibel Marina has been one of my clients for, I can prove, 17 years. The reason I did that this morning, checked the computer to find out what year the first record was, and that's the last year we probably worked there for 25 years, okay? I know these people, I know what they stand for, I know what they do. We know as a company, when we go in there to do whatever work we do for them, we're under strict regulation as to what we can do, where we can do it, where our vehicles have to be parked. So we know they're concerned for not only their customers, not only to maintain their place, but also concern for any other pedestrian or person entering that property. Overall, I, I, I know their safety concerns. I know their care for their facility. They do not, shall we say, poor boy in the construction vernacular. They do not poor boy anything. If something needs fixing, they get it fixed. They get it fixed right. And it gets fixed to modern code. So they have a sustainability built into this place. They believe in, first, safety. Everything is safety. Second is service. Third is sustainability. We as a company react to them 24 hours a day. Our overall position on this is, I know 55 people 
that moved to Fort Myers, Florida from Rochester, New York because of the boating. That boating, our waterfront position, brings the people here. Most of the people that come here get the proverbial sand in their shoes and wind up wanting to stay here. Most of them have boats. The last record I picked up quickly on, there was over 40,000 boats registered in the 2004 registration. 44,900, I think it was. So boat is, boating is a big part of our economy here, big part of our draw, big part of our people that come here. We need every boat slip we can find. We need every facility we can find. If you go out there right now with COVID and whatever, you'll find out that boating has become one of the things that helps these people sustain themselves, taking their family out on a boat, being properly distanced somewhere other than being locked up in the house, which is unfortunately where we're going to find ourselves again, it seems to be where we're headed. But overall, there's a health aspect, there's an economic aspect, and there's just a plain financial aspect associated with what Fort Myers is and what the state of Florida is. We are a water-based community. There's no two ways about it. So I am firmly, firmly encouraging you to go ahead and get this thing approved and let's get it built. We can use it in our, in our whole life here now. And these people are the people that we should be supporting, investing in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul Dahlman. Good morning. I've been in this community for 28 years. The reason I moved here is two reasons. One, my children, they were young and we were looking for a good education for them. The second was, I'm a lifelong boater. I need the water, so I was looking for a wonderful boating community. I looked up and down the entire state of Florida, didn't want to leave Florida but I wanted somewhere where my children could get a good education and I can be out on the water. This is a diamond in Florida. People haven't realized it. The boating community here is fantastic. It's beautiful out there. You've got mangroves. You don't have a concrete jungle like you do in Miami or Tampa. There are other boating communities in Florida, like Tampa, but they don't have the inland bays that are protected from the weather like we do. This is a better boating community. The only other area in all of the state of Florida that even comes close is Miami. The problem with Miami is you don't see the wildlife. It's gone. It's all concrete. Here, you have the beautiful mangroves. You have the beautiful islands. This is what is drawing people to the community. And I appreciate you doing that and watching out for the environment. But it's a double-edged sword here. Because of that, you're getting people here that want to move here because of that. You've got to make room for them. Otherwise, the economy is not going to grow. This, people are going to leave here. You're going to make it so difficult for them that they don't care about what they can see because they can't get out. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, this is a boating community and supported very well by mechanics, boat mechanics, boat suppliers, restaurants. The, the chain goes on and on and on. What we need is a well-balanced, and I believe that you all are looking at it that way, resolution to the people that are coming in. This COVID has caused us to look at this differently. The jump in the number of people that are now boating just to get out of their house is amazing. 
people are buying boats at an incredible rate. There are manufacturers that are out a year before you can even get a boat because they've been sold out. Where are they going to put them? There are communities where they're deed restricted. You can't put a boat there. Okay. Well, there are people that have docks at the back of their homes, and they can keep it in the water, some of them, or they can put it on a lift. But that's a very small percentage. People can't put it in the backyard of their house or the side yard. They can't put it in the front yard of the house. Again, the county will, will tell them, no, they can't do that. So where are they going to put it? Are you going to tell them, no, I'm sorry, you've got to get rid of your boat, or you have to move it to some other community like Naples or Punta Gorda so that they could go out on the water? I, I think that's a big disadvantage, and I don't think you're going to get people moving here because of that. Please, don't put your blinders on for the few. Take them off and look at the big picture. See what we have coming in. And look at the thousands that you can make happy. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Fischler. Good morning. I'll be brief. My name is Phil Fischler. I'm a small business owner in this community. My address is 2310 First Street, Suite 210. Um, I'm an applicant, or I'm a, uh, I'm a customer of the applicant. And from what I've experienced, they run a quality operation, much like you've heard from many of the others who have been before you. Um, that theirs is the kind of business that we should be supporting. It's the kind of business that we want to see grow in our community. Not only the service that they provide to the residents, but also the many visitors there. Uh, I'm on property nearly every week, and uh, they do a fantastic job serving not only our community, but all the, the folks that come to visit our area. Um, so in conclusion, I would just, as many of the others have mentioned, encourage you to consider the, the value that they're providing our community and the residents, and uh, encourage you to approve their application. Thank you. Michael Fellini. Good morning. My name is Michael Zeleny. I'm a local boat owner. I'm a charter captain, and I'm one of the two forklift operators at Port Sandoval Marina. And a lot of what I wanted to say this morning has already been repeated. So I'll kind of try to keep this short for you guys. But one thing I'd like to focus on are a lot of the customers that are finding it very difficult to find a, find a place for their boat, a place to keep their boats. I live in an HOA community. I couldn't keep my boat where I live. So I have to have a similar facility like Port, Port Sanibel Marina, um, like has been mentioned before. Um, a lot of the customers that we have at Port Sanibel Marina um, are coming in fresh. They're coming into this community knowing it's a boating community, but they don't know much about boats. They don't know much about boating. And when they come to our facility and ask us about storage, about what kind of boats they have, and get an answer of, we apologize, we have a year and a half long waiting list to get into our facility. It's a resounding gasp. They, they cannot believe why it takes so long for them to get a get a place to keep their boat. And this is the same with other marinas. You get this at Salty Sam's, you get this at Cape Harbor. Facilities are full. Public access points are bottlenecked. Try taking your boat to a public access point during a busy holiday weekend. You won't. And a lot of folks are parking on the side of the road and taking the fine. It's just a pay to play. They're taking that ticket because they don't have a place to go. A lot of the congestion at our marina is from folks that are on our waiting list that don't have a place to keep their boat. They want to take their families out during holiday weekends. They want to spend time with their folks. It's COVID. A lot, a lot, more, folks are, a lot more folks are boating nowadays. And the resounding answer that they get from us is, we apologize, we don't have space. We have to wait for other folks to leave and work off our 150-person waiting list. 
it's just it's only been getting worse. There's there's no place for people to keep to keep their boats. Um, I'd like you to keep that in mind with this with this project, uh, if if at all possible. I think this is an is an amazing area, but I too see in the in the near future, in the long term as well, if our public access points dwindle, and we don't have enough places to keep boats, where are people going to go? I think they're going to leave town and find find another place. Thank you. Can of Stewart. guys. My name is Tatum Stewart. I'm born and raised here in Fort Myers. Um, and I'll keep this brief because like a lot of people have said, it's been repeated. Um, so I boat pretty much every day. And the big thing I've noticed is the influx in people that are now using the boats more and more. And when you, whenever I drive over the causeway to Sanibel, the boat ramp's always packed. I mean, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you can't get a spot. I've got buddies that are using the boat ramp and they have to get there at five in the morning to be able to get a slip or a parking spot there. And then like Mike said, then they just start parking down the side of the road. And then we have people coming down to Port Sanibel. And so I just feel that having the additional boat storage could be tremendous uh, help with the congestion. And I mean, we're seeing more and more boats being bought with COVID and just this major influx of people trying to get out and enjoy the amazing waterways we have. So I think it would be a very, very good thing to be able to pass this on. Thank you, guys. See you. Hi, Trash. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle. Um, my name is Stephen Petrick, and I am with Renfro and Jackson Landscaping. When we're presently the maintenance contractor for the Port Sanibel Marina project, and I'm personally the certified arborist um, with the company, um, we're fully in support of the project, as is everybody that has spoken previously. Um, if we're chosen for the install portion of the project, our diverse group of professionals uh, will work to guide the project um, through the successful completion and being sensitive to all the site and landscape related activities that are going to take place around those fairly large buildings. So we will, we will be hands on uh, through, <clears throat> through the implementation of the project if we are chosen. Um, on a side note, um, I'm a Lee County resident and a boater and I personally keep my boat to the south and have used Port Sanibel Marina many, many times. And uh, if this uh, facility is approved, I may be moving my boat to the northern portion of the of the county to access the waterways that are that are much different. So we're personally in support of the project. Thank you. Thurman Mancini. Hello, commissioners. Uh, Jack Mancini, legally Herman. Thank you. Good to see you. I'm a residential real estate agent in uh, Lee and Collier County, and the market is on fire, and everybody's moving to Florida. They're taking their early retirement, I believe, and a lot of these families ask about boating. And as has already been mentioned, uh, marina storage is very uh, full. They're at full capacity. Uh, the opportunity to take the pressure off of um, Puna Rasa boat ramp and Port Sanibel Marina's boat ramp. Uh, the opportunities here, you see the boats if you go to Sanibel on the weekends, you see the boat, um, excuse me, the boat trailer is just lined up down the road all the way. The opportunity for the 10 uh, boat um, sites to be there with the uh, trailers will eliminate the 30 other boat trailers that are parked in the proposed uh, 
area for this second dry storage. So I think the opportunity to take the pressure off of the uh, marina with the people that uh, drive their boats in there and launch them, along with Puna Rasa boat ramp, uh, would be a great opportunity. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Scott Rush? Good morning. Frank, you recognize me? God, you I had dark curly that. hair. I had dark curly hair when, when uh, I would go into Port Comfort and try to sell them uh, uh, products. Uh, it was a dump. It was, it was just open racks of storage of junk. And we have developed and developed to where we're trying to have a beautiful facility along Port Comfort Road, which was named that before Connie Mac Island was developed. It comes down pretty simple. The, the, the county, the government, has not kept up with the demands of the boating public for access to the water. It has not. Repeated again and again and again. I've had San Carlos Marine for 44 years. I've also ran Bay Marina, Airport Marine, Matt Lachey Marina. We do not have enough access for boaters to get to the water. You, we've, got a, we've got a handful of privileged people who are in Connie Mac Island who do not want their canals to have additional boating traffic and are throwing all kinds of obstacles to a beautiful and needed project. Please approve this. Thank you. Ray John? Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ray John. I'm general manager of Fishtail Boats here locally. Um, we have a few different operations. Uh, back in February, I stood right here, same spot, and uh, pleaded also for uh, this clause to put the additional um, building of storage for Port Sanibel Marina. Um, you know, back in February, things were a little bit different than they are now. Um, come March, the world changed. Uh, we never, we didn't know what was going to happen at that time. Fishtail didn't know if our 50-plus employees were going to have a job again. Um, within a week or two, we were bringing back, people back to work. Um, at this time, we probably sold, and this is without exaggeration, five, 600 boats since the beginning of this COVID operation. We have right now over 100 sold that we're trying to get in build for our new customers. I've lived here 40 plus years. I have yet to see any local government stand beside the marine industry when it comes forward to local waterfront uh, turn more residential than it has to, um, I guess, participate in what we all moved here for was, uh, um, I guess, to enjoy our outdoors. Um, port Sanibel Marina is a, uh, a great business partner. We do a lot of business with them. They do a lot of business locally. They support a lot of families as we do um, we need more room there are already 147 people waiting to get in there at this time uh, the new marina on Fort Myers Beach is full every marina we're trying to get boats located into are full they have I've watched this now with this group uh, they have tried to put everything in order for, the, we know neighbors, we, and I don't think you're gonna have a better neighbor than this group here. Um, they've tried to amend to all the concessions that have been asked. And uh, I guess really, I think we need it guys. Uh, this is something that we've been looking for for a long time. And uh, I'll stand here again next time if we have to, to, and I'll still stand for these guys. So thank you very much for your time. King Gibson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, board members, uh, 
My name's Gene Gibson. For the record, I appreciate having the opportunity to address you this morning. I have a 24-foot boat that I keep at Port Sanibel Marina. I live in a condominium with a deed restriction. Even if I got my condo to lift that restriction, there wouldn't be room for a boat there. So if I'm going to go boating, which is why I live here, I have to have wet or dry storage someplace. And there's not, from my perspective, there's not a better place in Lee County to keep your boat, given the access to all the Pine Island Sound and the Caloosahatchee, where I do most of my boating. Not only is it the perfect spot from my perspective, but from a land use planning perspective, it's the perfect spot. Port Comfort Road is all about marine uses. And all we're, they're trying to do is expand an existing use. Good luck trying to put in a marina and boat slips or dry storage any place else in Lee County, even though it's sorely needed. I don't have to tell you the difficulties in the permitting, but here's an existing use that needs to be expanded. Personally, this is a no-brainer. Thank you. Thank you. James Mowen? James Mowen? Morning. My name is Jim Mullen. I live on uh, County Mac Island. I'm a boater. <clears throat> I've listened to all these folks talk today about we need more boats, we need more boat slips, we need to get more boats on the water. And you look at these access points, and you go out on that water in your boat, which I do, there are thousands of boats. And this is such a busy, busy area we're talking about. We don't need to add more boats to that area. My wife and I, we don't boat on holidays or Saturday and Sundays. It's a zoo out there. You have wind, waves, boat wakes. I mean, I'm all for more boats on the water, but not at this particular spot. I think it's a mistake. I'm living in the community. You know, when you pull in the street that you live on, you say, ah, I'm almost home. We don't have that pleasure. We're not almost home. We deal with pedestrians, people stopping in Port Comfort Road and unloading their cars and trucks sometimes. It's never supervised by the marina. No one tells them they can't stop, they can't park. They block the bridge constantly trying to get into that boat ramp. And it really is an issue. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the setback of the new building needs to be set back farther. It's going to create such a tunnel for us when we pull into our community. I think that needs to be addressed as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Meredith McBride. Ma'am, before you start, you filled out five cards. You only get to speak once. Sounds good. I represent uh, five different property owners. That's fine. I can get through all of their letters in five minutes. For the record, my name is Meredith McBride. I am an attorney at Hom Lozier and Parks, and I represent five different property owners in Jonathan Harbor, Steve Adler, Dale Adler, Don Resch, and Rosemarie Resch, as well as Bernie Wessels. First letter, Honorable County Commissioners, Hearing Officer, and Staff of Lee County. We have been residents of Jonathan Harbor for over 16 years. We're in full agreement with the Lee County staff and special magistrates recommend recommendation to approve the proposed Port Sanibel Marina expansion and plan amendments necessary to enable the expansion. The proposed use is more compatible and higher and better use for this site when compared to the current fully approved hotel designation. From our viewpoint, some residents of Jonathan Harbor are in favor of the proposed boat storage development 
with specific stipulations the developer has provided. Some oppose the development altogether, and some are indifferent. In our opinion, the marina operators have proven to be good neighbors and operate a safe and professional business. The marina expansion would provide additional boat storage that is needed for the growing Lee County population. It would also comport with the county's master plan for the area. We are in favor of the proposed expansion and use changes necessary to accomplish the expansion. The developer, Roberts Development Corp., has been attentive and responsive to our concerns and the concerns of the other Jonathan Harbor residents by stipulating multiple concessions and modifications for the boat marina expansion. The letter goes through different um, concessions that the, that the developer has made. I won't go through all of those so that I can make it through uh, some of the other points and some of the other letters. But once again, we support the approval of the revised marina expansion and necessary zoning plan amendments. It complies with the county's master plan. It provides much needed boat storage for the residents of the county. And this project is being constructed as an, as an expansion of an existing marina use that has very low impact given the intermittent use of boat owners. In our opinion, it would certainly have less of an impact than the approved hotel plan site plans for this site. And that's signed by Stephen and Dale Adler and Don and Rosemary Rush. The second letter is from Bernie Wessels. Dear Lee County Commissioners, hearing officers, and staff, by way of introduction, my name is Bernie Wessels. I own a home at 14650 Jonathan Harper Drive on Connie Mac Island. A little history about myself, I was a member of a local planning commission for over 10 years, an elected board member of a planning agency board of directors for five, and an elected official in the city council for almost 10 years. I understand the difficulties you have in making the correct decision to make our community a better place to live and work. I first want to thank everyone for the sometimes thankless jobs you are doing. I am in full agreement with the Lee County staff and special magistrates recommendation regarding the proposed Port Sanibel Marina expansion plans and amendments necessary to enable the ex expansion. I have read the incredible, incredibly detailed reports and exhibits. I certainly commend the developer, developer and staff for making the changes to address the concerns of the Jonathan Harbor Homeowners Association. The proposed use is certainly more compatible and a better use for this site when compared to the currently approved hotel motel use designation. I certainly respect some of my neighbors' opposition and opinions to this project. Some neighbors in Jonathan Harbor are in favor with the specific conditions below. I have spoken with the marina operators about the changes along with a few questions over the issues. In particular, to boats on the trailers parked and blocking traffic on Port Comfort Road. They have assured me that this will be addressed with the expansion by only allowing parking for 10 boat trailers. Ramp launching will be reduced because most of those will now be in the new storage facility and making Port Comfort Road a fire lane. While being in favor of the proposed expansion, I want to emphasize the importance of these specific conditions that I understand have already been agreed to by the developer. One, for new landscaping, landscaping plans submitted to be planted alongside the roadway between the planned sidewalks and streets to screen the new building and to restrict parking along the road. Two, that no, par that no parking signs will be added to the Port Comfort Road right-of-way. This should be a designated fire lane for the residents of Jonathan Harbor, if possible, allowing the marina to tow anyone in violation. Three, that there will be no boats taken across Port Comfort by forklift. Do you mind if I finish his points? wrap up your point that'd be great okay. uh, some of the points have already been made so uh, Bernie I appreciate any assurances from the items for the items listed and in, incorporated into the final plans for your acceptance again a huge thank you to everyone and the entire staff I am some in support of the arena expansion development and necessary plan amendments thank you Thanks. Jennifer Sapin
Good morning. For the record, my name is Jennifer Sapin. I'm an AIC certified land planner with Barocco and Associates. When we talked about this last, we went through several slides, and you're seeing these again, so I'll go through them rather quickly. But the words we're looking for are highlighted in yellow um, regarding compatibility here, the Land <laughs> Development Code. We're looking whether the proposal is negative or harmful to the existing uses. Is it destructive to the character and integrity of the residential environment? Does it provide visual harmony and screening? Does it avoid negative impacts to the surrounding land uses? And then we'll look at intensity. Here again highlighted, intensity isn't an increase in intensity, looking at size, impact, bulk, and shape. First, we'll start looking at the currently approved hotel, the rendering shown here that is included with the approved zoning resolution. You'll see the height is in the back, far away from Port Comfort Road. There's varying setbacks depending on the height of the building. Here we're comparing on the left the existing um, hotel and on the right the proposed boat barn. While the larger width is nearly the same, you can see the shape of the building uh, is only large in one area of the 289 feet. Pretty much the average of the building is down to 237 with only a 65 foot wide building right along Port Comfort Road. I'll also point out the two star areas. Those are single story structures with the one in front of Port Comfort on, and an elevated single, single story structure. Looking here at setbacks, the proposed setback for the boat barn is 10 foot along the entire width of Port Comfort Road. The current development order approved um, hotel shown here, you can see the setbacks varies. One foot for that single story portico share but the majority of the building is set back 25 feet, in some areas as much as 52 feet. Looking and comparing these two, you can see the building on the right is an increase in size, impact to the residents, bulk and shape of the building. Keep in mind when you're reviewing this that there are two deviations being utilized to put this boat barn in where it's currently proposed. Now, these deviations are already approved, but your land development code would require an additional buffer, five additional feet more than what is proposed. And there's also a setback deviation. So two requests from the land development code to bring this, this boat barn closer to the road and the residents. I also want to point out the new landscape condition. Um, they, uh, the applicant mentioned that there's additional landscaping that was just added through this, this next process. That will not be along Port Comfort Road. It's shown here in green. It's behind the parking. While it will soften the building near the preserve, it won't soften the building in the edge where the residents are most going to be impacted by the building. So in conclusion, an expansion of an approved use is not inherently compatible. Um, more boat barn near the road does not necessarily mean that it is compatible and it is not an increase in intensity. And in fact, in my opinion, it is an increase in intensity. Um, the, the pro bar, it is an increase in intensity and it does negatively impact the residents on, on Port Comfort Road. And what I would ask this board to consider is an increased setback to allow the, the developer at least the minimum land development code required landscape buffer, which they are only proposing a 10 foot area. The land development code requires at a minimum of 15 feet. They, they have added additional landscaping in addition to what the land development code would require a port, along Port Comfort Road, but only palm trees that account to a total of 15 palm trees. And with that, I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Linda Hanwacker. While she's setting up, uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, I'm here to defer my time. Should Linda need any more time? Um, Gerard Hanwalker, her husband. Yes, good morning, commissioners. I'm delighted to be here and speak upon some issues that we have and some very serious concerns moving forward. 
Uh, again, with your comments, real parking problems, busy neighborhood already, impact, intensity, setback, and the current proposal that we've been dealing with was 10 pounds in a five pound bag and need to have five pounds in a five pound bag. Well, we have three key issues that we're concerned with, plus some really new developments since this has been going on for four years now. Um, next slide, it's not moving. Oh, there it goes. We've heard today that there has been an intense increase in boat traffic and boat demand. Yes, definitely. COVID has definitely stressed our waterway. If you look at the pictures here, what I'm showing is um, we actually have two new developments that you would not have previously addressed. COVID has uh, impacted our small back waterway filling in due to significant increase in boat traffic from the marina. The photos here are from Google Earth. The blue circles show the diminishing area where silt is filling in. The yellow arrow shows where channels were formerly visible. The small back waterway it is at low tide, not only at low tide, but at other points in time, boats are hitting bottom. Also, animals are being impacted. We had a dead bull shark walk up, uh, wash up on our property because the propeller hit it because the water is getting so shallow. Um, boats now typically run roughly from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., most speeding in and out, creating large wakes because they're in a hurry to get in and in a hurry to get out. Um, and many times returning boats must line up in the first few homes because there's no place to accommodate the return. Connie Mac Island also has erosion uh, occurring because of this and we're not allowed to put up seawalls to prevent it. Also another new development, again, we need to look at the big picture of what's happening here. There are two adjacent properties now that have come into the picture. We have 17250 McGregor Boulevard, which is zoned as a marina. It's not developed yet. We also have now what's called the Sanibel Passage. There's 50 units to be built that's already approved. But they are now looking to dredge the waterway and have access to this small back waterway as well. There's only so much this waterway can handle. How much can we increase boat usage there? Our three top issues were intensity. Again, you had talked about this, and we're taking the 133 plus 118. We are now at 251. This is a 90% increase in what currently exists. We've seen a duplicate or a doubling of boat usage due to COVID, which is causing the silt to fill in. So pretty soon we're not even going to have a waterway. Uh, next was the fire safety issue. The ho hotel was set back from the road. The boat barn is not. It's not a same comparison. Um, so we did ask if they would position the new boat barn next to the old one so that if something did happen, we would still have access in and out of Port Comfort Road using their parking lot. Um, they did not want to move it. Um, the other issue is that really we're basically putting a fuel tanker truck at the roadway. With these boats, there's just an amount uh, an immense amount of fuel right at the road. If a fire breaks out, we're in trouble. And parking is a real problem still. Our recommendation, first of all, is that this project needs to reapply and go through the process again since it's been so many years and there's new information and other developments that need to be considered since it's a small back waterway. It needs to be addressed. There's many new concerns that you've not previously addressed due to the timing. Uh, especially with Sanibel Passage and COVID. So who's addressing the demise of this waterway? Who's going to preserve it? Who's addressing the safety, especially fire and other things like visitors, children, and children who go to school and take the bus at the end of Port Comfort Road? Or are we going to accept this huge risk? Um, if we want to make some kind of compromise, we really shouldn't increase the boat traffic at this point more than 25%. We also should know that the forklift needs to not pose a safety hazard. Setbacks really should be 25 feet if we're adding this much fuel at the roadway. Um, and the architecture, we don't want to be back to the hearing examiner to cross the road. While they've removed the boat barn door, the structure remains in place that at a future date, they could do some minor modifications and ask and request to cross the road again. So that is my comments of what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like my PowerPoint to be put on the record. So 
I don't know who I hand that to. Thank you. Is it Tracy? Commissioners, thank you for allowing us to uh, speak and talk a little bit about our site. My name is Sid Tracy. I am a resident of Jonathan Harbor. I'm also president of the uh, HOA. Uh, we see a lot of development as well as on the boats. We see a lot of need for boats. Uh, but it's a lot of need that comes on us as well. We have 69 residents, roughly 150 people that will come up and down that road every single day. Uh, we, we see a lot of intensity that creates problems. We've, uh, we see cars parked along the side. We have to go around them, and we have actually have had police calls uh, because it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes. It's a very small road. I'm not saying that, that as a former businessman that, that business should not expand because it should. But I also say that it's, that it's got to be done in perspective. This is a very, very intensive, intensive, large undergoing. Uh, it will have impact for us for a long time. If we're going to consider it, I like the curbs. Uh, let's just keep them off the road. That 10 feet from our road is going to make it look like we're going through Grand Canyon. Uh, if we could just say, let's push it back. Let's, let's, let's give us some space. Uh, you know, we contribute to the community as well. As 69 homes, we pay close to a million dollars in taxes a year. Uh, we, we, we love to boat. Most of us do have boats, and, and those that uh, don't have docks as well. But I wish you would take into consideration of the intensity. This is a massive project. Uh, we've seen it. You've seen it. And what we need to do is to say, let's step back a little bit, maybe set it back. Uh, Linda Hanwacker, who just spoke as a former is, is a board member uh, and is our official position. We are seeing the fill-in of the canals. We're seeing activities uh, with everything now being directed on the backside and removed. It's a much shallower, it's a much longer distance, and it's also where all of the canoers, uh, it's intense. But I appreciate your considerations, and thank you. Thank you. Andy Cunningham? I'm Danny Cunningham, a resident of, uh, of uh, Connie Mac Island. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, I'm not here to say we should reject the project, but I'm not, I don't think we've got it finalized yet. Uh, uh, Commissioner Mann, at the last session, you said go and do, make substantial changes. Adding six parking spots, in my opinion, is not addressing the intensity and density issue. Um, and I'll get into that in just a little bit more. I also want to say that because of COVID, a lot of the people that oppose this are not traveling and are homebound, and so you don't have quite the representation from our community here today, but it's not because of a lack of interest at all. It's because of their concern for their personal safety. As I said, this is the fifth time that uh, I've spoken either to you or to the Planning Commission. Each time I've, I'm an accountant, I've tried to use numbers to show the parking. Uh, uh, Commissioner Ruin, you, this is your first chance to hear me with the numbers, but I'm sure that uh, it'll come across just crystal clear. <laughs> um, the, um, the parking issue, uh, while we had pictures up on the screen a few moments ago, or a half hour ago, those pictures were in September and February, not when we have the peak season, not when we have the worst parking problems. Uh, but I've presented pictures in the past of upwards of 30 vehicles and trailers uh, attached trailers, parking in that area. Uh, it is parking and it has been used by parking from the restaurant, from the, from the boat uh, launches, from the charter captains. Uh, when they put up the code numbers a little bit ago, I don't understand all the code, I'm not a planning expert, but they didn't mention the paddleboard rental operation, they didn't mention the kayak rental operation. There's three party boats that they only had two party boats up there. Uh, there's boat maintenance vehicles, detailers, boat repairs, summarization. Uh, lay up people that use the marina. None of that was uh, listed as, as uses or required uses. 
So I don't believe that they are excess. They may be excess in the theory of the code. The code was written many, many years ago before the practicality of today's uh, ways that we utilize the water. So I, I think that we need to send this back again and address the parking. Uh, six spots is not enough to address the concern. We've got to figure out a way either by eliminating activities or eliminating the size of the boat barn to get the parking issue because once this thing is built, we're not going to have a way of addressing that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Aaron Moynihan. Followed by Peter. Morning. Um, I'm Karen Monahan. I live at Jonathan Harbor. I've been there since 2000. Um, as you know, Port Comfort Road is a narrow and short road with eight curb cuts presently. It's 20 feet wide, which is thin, and about 900 feet long. On a normal day, it's very congested, as everyone has said. They include the boat launchings, the boats, the restaurant retail, retail patrons boat owners and users, scenic boat tour patrons, etc. Port Comfort is the sole ingress and egress for our on uh, Connemac Island. RNL demonstrates daily that it views business operations at a higher priority than our neighbor. It, it routinely permits its patrons to block the road and fulfill its business needs. This raises the question of what happens with higher volumes or during the period of un unusual circumstances. Did you ever see what happened to the marina preceding a hurricane? What happens when 300 boat owners want to get their boats out of the water of the boat shed? Did you ever see what happens to a boat shed during and after a hurricane? Do you remember what happened to the boat shed on Pine Island? from Charlie, who will control the road. This is what, this is an evacuation plan for, uh, what is the evacuation plan for Connemac Island? Will emer emergency vehicles have access to Connemac Island during unusual times? I believe a setback of 15 or 20 feet would provide a far greater flexibility for access to Connemac Island during abnormal times. Thank you. Peter Moynihan. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. I'm Pete Monahan. I've been a resident of uh, Jonathan Harbor for over 20 years and uh, also a director of uh, the HOA. Um, the Port Sanibel Marina is a relatively light-use, moderate-scale development, including fine restaurant, marina, and dry storage. The previously approved boutique hotel would complement those, those existing features, adding the residential component. Unfortunately, the oversized boat shed being proposed transforms this site from a fully integrated light use facility, in my view, to more of a commercial industrial storage and marine facility that is not compatible with our neighborhood. The proposed dry shed feature is about 50% larger than the existing boat shed. This new shed is nearly 300 feet long. Thus, the proposed shed results in a continuous massive complex, which is some 450 feet long, adding the two together, and is nearly five stories high. This massive size of structure is exaggerated by its proximity to the road and uh, provides very insufficient space, in my view, to use vegetation adequately to soften this bulky, oversized structure. The rationale they use for the proposed 10-foot setback is to be consistent with the existing shed. I don't think anybody would agree that 400 feet, 450 feet of consistency is the desired feature of this particular development. 
The combination of a 450-foot facility length and over 30 feet sheer wall will create a tunnel-like phenomenon when you enter the road to our neighborhood. This effect is greatly exaggerated by only a 10-foot setback. This tunnel effect would substantially lessen would be, would be substantially lessened if the setback was restricted to at least 20 feet. Not only would it substantially improve the visual appearance, it would <coughs> add very, very important and viable space for the inclusion of some 30 or 40 mature type forms of vegetation to, to soften the, spar the starkness of this uh, rectangular shaped boat shed. The, the current reliance again, I'm talking strictly on the west side, of palm trees uh, is woefully inadequate given the size and shape of this building. <coughs> In summary, uh, the nature and scope of the proposed boat shed represents a far more intensive use, in my view, of this property than was contemplated by the 1999 CPD. The encroachment of this boxy, bulky, bulky boat shed and uh, the associated far in boat traffic that it's going to promote is destructive to the character and nature of the Jonathan Harbor community. A moderation of the proposed building size is required to make this structure compatible with our neighborhood. To me, modification is best achieved by maintaining a setback that's more, that's closer to the 25 uh, foot ex existing code. Thank you. Any questions? Senator Persons? Good morning, Mr. Chair and Board. For the record, Jenna Persons, Strayhorn and Persons Law Firm, on behalf of Jonathan Harbor Community Association. And you heard from a few of our, our board members this morning, as well as some of the residents who were able to make it here. As one of the speakers noted, multiple residents have um, health issues or health concerns and were unable to be with us this morning. Can, stop for a second. Can someone fix your time? Thank you. And, and I promise, Mr. Chair, I will be much less than five minutes. In thinking about this case, and the journey that we have all been together over the last three plus years. I looked back to the first hearing in front of this board three years ago. Mr. Hammond was here, uh, Mr. Manning was here, and the uh, past but not forgotten, Mr. Kiker was here. The board at that time discussed why this project was too intense. And I remembered some words that are gone but not forgotten, Commissioner Kiker said. He said, this is a pretty serious subject for a lot of people. Here we are today, three years later, and this is still a serious subject for a lot of people. And what has been presented is still too intense for this neighborhood. You've heard the continuing concerns from multiple residents today, but you've also heard from multiple residents substantial points of compromise that would go a long way in resolving this neighborhood dispute. For example, with our last speaker, you heard that a mere 10 additional feet of setback, still less than the 25 required by code, plus the full 15 foot of buffer and enhanced landscaping would go a long way in resolving this neighborhood dispute. So here we are today and we're asking, please take another hard look. A lot changes over three years, and we're close, but we're just not there yet. And if this neighborhood dispute, if this project cannot be resolved, we ask that this board stand by its original denial of the original request. Thank you. 
John Jackalure. Good morning. <clears throat> I'd like to address the issue of compatibility between this proposal and our community, and also the fact that words are cheap and actions are what counts. So when I drive out of my community, as I did this morning, here's what I see on the left-hand side of the road. I see the boat barn, and I don't see a pretty building. It was built about 10 years ago, plus or minus, and it's dirty. It's got mold all over it. Okay, so that's not a pretty sight. Then as I move a little bit further down the road, I see an RTL truck trailer parked there, abandoned for four years. Hasn't been moved, hasn't got served any purpose except it looks ugly. It looks like a, an industrial park. I move a little bit further and I see all those boat trailers. But what's growing beside them and through them is weeds. It looks like a dump. Then I see abandoned boats there, okay? So what this, this is actions versus words, okay? It makes it look like an industrial slum, okay? Now, what I want you guys to do, excuse my language, is to picture an image in your mind if we were to build this thing at the end of your street and build a dump there, and you had to drive by there multiple times a day, how you would like it, because we don't like it. So please think about that when you're looking at approving this thing or not approving it. Thank you. Last card I have is Joe Mazurkowitz. Morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Joe Mazurkowitz, President of BJM Consulting, here on behalf of the Southwest Florida Marine Industry Association. I'd like to talk about two, two different things in very specific, uh, one to the boating industry and one to this site. First of all, the economic impact of recreational voting in Southwest Florida is big business. And let me just give you, and it means, it means business, and it, me, it brings money, jobs, commerce, and employees to thousands of families. And you've heard that already this morning. But let me throw some numbers associated with that. These numbers come from the Recreational Marine Research Center at Michigan State University. These are not my numbers. The annual impact is, eight, is just shy of $900 million. The number of industry businesses is 550 plus. Number of jobs are over 7,000. The annual income to boating related jobs is just under 300 million. Annual boating related spending is 366 million. The number of boats in Lee County are so dense that our area is number one per capita for boating ownership in the state of Florida. This is big business for us. And what, in, and you've heard this already once, but what this site brings to this dilemma, if you will, this economic engine, is access to boaters, access for boaters, to the water who do not live on the water. There are a lot of folks in Lee County who enjoy recreational boating who don't have the benefit of the folks on Connie, at the folks on Connie Mac Island have of having a boat and access to water in their backyard. They need the ability to get access to the great waters of Southwest Florida. That is clear, and this project does go to promote that. But let's talk about, if I could take my marine industry hat off and put on my old hat that I used to wear when I sat on the other side of the dais across the river as a decision maker in public policy regarding zoning issues. And what did you listen to? What should you listen to as a public policy maker with regard to zoning? Compatibility. Your staff has recognized the fact that this is indeed, this use is compatible and it's actually just the expansion of a pre-existing use. The use that existed before most of the people moved out to Connie Mac Island. My first time on Connie Mac Island was meeting Connie Mac III when he was getting ready to run for Congress in 1978. It was pretty vacant. There wasn't a lot happening out there. But you know what? I drove right through the marina to get there. Everyone who moved out to Connie Mac Island recognized the fact that their access was through an operating marina. This is no surprise to them. And this is very important when you make a public policy decision. Because you have to think about, think about it as the fact 
do reasonable property owners have the expectation for similar uses adjoining them as they move forward? So as a reasonable property owner or potential property owner going to Connie Mac Island, did they have the reasonable expectation to understand or should, have they, should they have understood that driving into the island, they were going to be going through a marina in perpetuity? Yes, they should have. Did the expansion of the residential community on Pontiac, uh, Connie Mac Island increase? Absolutely. The pictures of it today on Google Earth shows it as almost a fully developed community. It wasn't like that in 1978. But does the adjoining property owner who has been deemed compatible have the same right to expand their use as a residential community did? Well knowing that they were driving through that marina all the time to get there. As a public policy maker, I would say it is compatible. The people on, 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 uh, in Jonathan Harbor had the expectation of expansion to that marina just as they had the expectation of expansion to the residential community that they live in. The applicant has listened to previous comments. They have addressed it. They, these changes will make it, uh, will have a positive impact on some of the negative conditions that exist today. The new dry storage facility has a footprint that is similar to the hotel, which is a more intense use than a dry storage facility by any planning standard. And the aesthetics and landscape will enhance the entrance to Jonathan Harbor and Connie Mac Island greater than what it is today. The previous speaker just talked about driving through what he looks like an industrial area. With this improved project, they will no longer see that industrial area as they drive into their project. They will see a commercial marina that is aesthetically pleasing to everyone going through. Thank you very much. To all the public comment cards I have, has I missed anybody that would like to speak in public comment? Commissioners, I'd love to take a five minute comfort break, if that's okay. Come back at 1130. Come back at 1130, that sounds great, thank you.
County Board of County Commissioners zoning hearing meeting will reconvene. Um, we took all public comment. I'll close comment, public comment at the moment. And the applicant would like to come up and address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Beverly Grady, for the record. Um, one, one clarification I wanted to make, and speaker number six, Tatum Stewart, is still here. I wanted to clarify when he spoke of boat trailers lining up on the road, he was speaking of Summerlin Road, not Port Comfort Road. Right, Tatum? Correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, at, but first one we'd like to call to respond to the design of the structure and withstanding hurricanes is our architect, Tyler Peterson. He'll briefly respond to that issue that was raised. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Tyler Peterson. I'm the president of uh, PDS Architecture. Just want to briefly talk about the overall design of the building. As we're all aware, the Florida Building Code does uh, require us to design to certain wind requirements based on the zone. This building, I believe, is in 150 or 160 mile an hour zone, so we are in compliance with that. We actually finished uh, a very similar project out on Marco Island a couple years ago which did go through Hurricane Irma. That storm had sustained winds of 120 miles per hour, which would be a Cat 3. That building sustained zero damage. We had very little uh, fascia uh, deformation on the building, but that was about it. So structurally, um, we're very confident in the integrity of the building. So, any questions regarding that? You know, the only question I have, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, while, while we got the architect up there, or maybe this might be better for the planner, I just wanted somebody to talk about, so it, it was suggested several times, add another 10 feet to the set, setback. Could somebody just explain what the consequences of that would be? I would love to talk about that. Sure. Um, and, and just as a matter of rule, I, I'm involved in the design of the building, not necessarily the site design, so I can't necessarily talk about the setbacks or the landscaping. I will say that we started this project in 2015. So we originally designed a building. I have been here personally and made several presentations and we have made continuous concessions on redesigning the building. Every time we leave here, I get the phone call. We start adjusting the building. We start dialing it back, start dialing it back. There, there is a certain point where the building doesn't function. There, there's a certain depth of a boat that's gonna go in there that's based on the standard market boat that everybody here in this area has. I believe it's under 30 feet. You have a 30 foot boat on the other side, then you have a forklift. You have the size of the forklift, plus you have the forks. The forks are a function of the size of the boat. So when you start adding all of those up, that's your minimum depth of a building that just makes sense for an average uh, dry boat storage facility. We've been involved in several of these. Um, it, it, it is a process, it is a formula, and, and it, there is a function of the turning radius of, of the forklift. It doesn't just pivot on a dime. You gotta turn the boats in there, and um, there, there's a lot of calculations that go into it. So when people say, you know, ah, we'll just take off 10 feet from the building, that's, that's like losing the whole side of storage on a building. It's not, it's not that simple. Um, and the building, there, there, there's been a lot of talk about, well, we're going to drive down the road and it's this 50 foot tall canyon. We, we've designed the building to step back. We've designed the landscaping to be pedestrian friendly. So all of it really kind of stair steps up to give it more of a, a personal feel, if you will, as you're going down there. Um, <clears throat> the building was designed to mimic what is already there. And I think a lot of the people on the adjacent island bought their homes loving that stretch, loving that, that entrance onto their island, and we really tried hard to kind of mimic that same feeling, so. Okay, that answered my question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paula McMichael is going to respond to Jennifer Sapin's testimony and, and uh, they speak to the zoning that's adjacent. There was a claim there's going to be expanded marinas using this waterway and also speaking to the 10 foot setback deviation, which was already granted for the existing building that's there.
Good morning again, Paula McMichael for the record. And I'm just gonna pull back up our presentation here. Okay. Maybe. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to address was one of the speakers talked about that there were new marinas going in on the adjacent property, so th that is not correct. Um, the property to the north is all conservation lands. Those are owned by the state. The C1 zoning here, C1 only allows existing marinas to continue, so there's no permitted use of a marina for that property. And this RPD, um, you can't actually see all of it on this, on this aerial. It is 197 acres of conservation, including all of this piece and 11 acres of multifamily residential. So Marina is not a permitted use on that property either. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about was intensity. So again, this is an existing commercial plan development. Commercial uses, including dry boat storage, are already allowed on the site. So the request does not constitute an encroachment of commercial uses. The use of dry boat storage was previously considered to be compatible with the residential development on Connie Mac Island in a location that's actually closer to Connie Mac Island than this building. The marina has been in existence again since 1944. So the two uses, the commercial marina, residential development, were considered compatible in 1983 when the Connie Mac Island residential PUD was approved. So 40 years after this marina came into existence and it was considered compatible another 15 years later when this commercial plan development was approved. And then just looking at intensity. Um, intensity, as uh, Ms. Sapin brought up, it's based on use, size, impact, bulk, shape, height, coverage, sewage generation, water demand, traffic generation. Um, the proposed dry boat storage facility is less intense than the approved hotel. So again, we're reducing the height by 30 feet. So from 75 feet down to 45 feet. The building is comparable to the length of the approved hotel. Uh, the proposed dry boat storage doesn't place any demands on water or sewer. The 50 room hotel generates about 446 trips this generates, based on 179 new slips, 401 daily trips. So we're reducing traffic with 144 slips that gets reduced even further. And while not specifically listed with the definition of intensity, I'd also note that the hotel requires 60 spaces, parking spaces, and this requires 25 parking spaces. So we're reducing the parking demand as well. And we've made this comparison to the hotel, which is the permitted use. We've looked at the height, we've looked at trips, we've looked activ at activity, hours of operation. So hotel is a 24 seven use. The marina is basically open during daylight hours. The proposed dry boat storage facility is less intense than the hotel by every measure. The only thing that the opposition has come back to is the mass of the building. That somehow because it's a box, it's, it's no longer compatible. Um, that somehow the, the square shape, that it's, it's too rectangular and that somehow makes it not okay. Again, we've reduced the height by 30 feet. We've increased the setback. We've provided all this articulation of the building, the architectural design. We've made landscaping commitments. We've removed that crossing of Port Comfort Road. This is a compatible use. So again, we've reduced the impacts. We've reduced the intensity. We've added more parking. We've added 77 new spaces to the site. We've reduced the length of the building along Port Comfort Road. We've reduced the number of new slips to just 118. So reducing intensities, we're increasing parking. Um, there's been a perceived lack of parking due to parking within that vacant portion of the site. A lack of convenient paved parking, especially for boat trailers. Um, but that's being addressed with the development of Parcel D. Um, the other thing I wanted to look at was the landscaping. I'm sure there's an easier way to do that. So these are our landscaping commitments for the north side of Port Comfort Road. 
So we do have five canopy <coughs> trees for 100 linear feet, the non-continuous double row hedge, and the addition is what th they focused on, which is we are adding to the code requirements additional palms. And what the palms do is add height to the landscape buffer to, again, better, better buffer the building and your experience as you're, as you're driving along Port Comfort Road. Um, the other thing uh, Ms. Sapin talked about was that we're not enhancing buffers along Port Comfort Road, um, and, and that's, that's not accurate. So we have an enhanced buffer to the east of the building, and we are requiring trees to be installed at a higher height. So the code would require 10 feet, and we're providing 16 feet height at installation. And the palms would be uh, 14 feet rather than 10 feet at installation. So again, we are adding additional landscaping along Port Comfort Road. Um, the other thing she talked about was that the code requirement was 15 foot landscape buffer and we are providing a 10 foot landscape buffer. Um, one of the things you can put in a landscape buffer, I don't wanna get down in the details here, but is a, a sidewalk. So the sidewalk on this property is actually gonna be within the right of way, that, but that's a five foot side path, sidewalk plus a 10 foot landscape buffer. That actually meets the code requirement for a 15 foot landscape buffer. So we are providing everything that's required by code. Um, and the last thing I will talk about, I just wanna go back to the Lee plan, which talks about the importance of providing water access to the public, protecting marine oriented land uses from preemptive land uses, avoiding the displacement of water dependent shoreline uses, such as dry boat storage by non water dependent uses, such as a hotel. And the Lee plan also specifically encourages the use of dry boat storage. There are policies that call out for the use of dry boat storage. These are uplands at an existing marina and what the Lee plan supports and numerous goals, objectives and policies is increased opportunities for dry boat storage, rec recognizing that developable shoreline is a limited resource and the best way to maximize that limited resource is exactly what's proposed here, additional dry boat storage. One of the questions was um, the, the use of the boat ramp. We think it's important just to emphasize that the boat ramp usage is going to be reduced by this approval because now it will be limited to 10 trailer spaces uh, compared to the ava availability now of being able to park trailer spaces. And because, and I think you've heard sufficient testimony that there is a real demand because there's just such a lack of access. You also heard the statement made as to the actual usage increase. First, our records of usage for several years are filed in the records at, at the hearings that we've held. So that's clearly documented. I would ask the general manager, J.D. Minor, just to uh, respond to the question of what has been the increase of uh, boat usage in the year since COVID-19. Beverly, can I have a question for you? Yes. Do you have a timeline if whatever happens today, if it was approved, when you actually will be building the facility? Does the applicant have a timeline? Uh, we, well, uh, we do in that we have, we have filed for the development order. The development order is waiting for this decision. So when that development order is granted, they are going to proceed immediately into construction. Is that right, Lisa? The construction is going to take a couple of years, though? A year and a half, two years? Right. You need to give that information to the podium. But that I heard the answer, though. So I was just curious because for me personally, COVID is not an issue for that. But you can okay. continue that. Thank you, though. All right. What, what's your name? Got that. Yes, thank you. Good morning again. J.D. Miner, General Manager, Port San Bob Marina, for the record. Um, so we've seen uh, the largest increase we've seen with COVID um, was with our ramping. Um, with our dry storage residents, um, the, we have a lot of seasonal residents along with full-time residents. Um, we've seen 
less than 7%, it was like 6% change increase in usage on our storage. Uh, boat ramp was up significantly, um, maybe about 50%, and our boat rentals were up um, about 15%. Total usage, though, was just under 10% as far as what we've seen as an increase this year. And that's going from January 1 of 19 to November 30th of 19. I just ran this yesterday to January 1 of 20 to November 30th of 2020. Well, today is a decision for the future. It's for those living here, their seniors, their families, young and old, those who use the water, those who come here and why do they come to Lee County? It is for the sun, the water. You, I know you promote tourism, the beaches. Um, so what we're looking for is at an existing marina, there is a reason that the Lee plan has been adopted that has marina siting criteria. Why your policies encourage provision of boating slips at existing marinas. We have responded with major reductions to this request, both in the number of slips, only a net increase of 118, and in a reduction to the length of the building, increase landscaping. We have done everything and completed a complete redesign of the building since February. To alter that entrance to the side, it has been completely redesigned. We would respectfully submit that you should recognize that we have been found consistent with the LEAP plan and the land development code by your professional staff at every hearing, by the hearing examiner twice, and by the special magistrate, and we have reduced intensity since those findings and those recommendations. If you are inclined to approve, I have prepared a resolution that contains some revisions that would deal with uh, recognizing that we have dealt with the basis for denial of August 2019th that I would like to hand out, and county attorney has seen these. Um, and then um, the final speaker will be Hans Wilson. Of course, we are available for any questions that you have, but we would hope and request that with these revisions, you will find that we've met the LEAP plan and the land development code and will issue an approval. Thank you. Hans, if you want to come up. Oh, Chairman, if I may, well, the <clears throat> while Hans is coming up, just a question for our county attorney. With the staff recommendation being what it is, wouldn't we have our own resolution already drafted? We, we did, and we worked with Ms. Grady to revise the resolution that she's handing out now. So if the board agrees with the applicant and we request this motion be to adopt this resolution. Okay. All right. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grady. Good morning, gentlemen. For the record, my name is Hans Wilson. I'm a professional engineer and have been working on this project since Larry Roberts Sr. purchased it in 1995, so I've got a lot of experience with this site. I wanted to speak to a couple of items that were talked about uh, specific to the location. One of them had to do with the intensity of uses increasing. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind about dry storage facilities and boating in general is that when you have a dry storage facility, let's just say it's 200 slips. You don't have 200 slips launching every day. On a good day, you might have 5% launch. On a holiday weekend, you might have 10%. What boat storage and what boating really represents for most people is opportunity. It's a chance for you to go boating if you so desire. Uh, I think most of the people that spoke in support of the project spoke to it from the standpoint of the big picture and public access. Um, but I, what I really wanted to point out was that even the current increase in boating, which has been significant, and this is a great opportunity for me to extend a thank you to the board, and at the time when uh, Commissioner Hammond was the chair, of not shutting down our boat ramps, that was very important for our community. And I think that's played out very well for the mental health of our people that otherwise can't go to the ball games, and can't go to the movies, they can't do those other recreational pursuits that the pandemic has basically shut down. So 
Yes, we've had an increase in boat traffic this season, this summer, as reported by uh, a number of the residents. But in many respects, that's temporal uh, in two parts. Because of COVID, eventually, I'm hopeful this pandemic will go away. But also because we've also had a significant increase in launching at the boat ramp. That's going to go away. Right now, the open field where the dry storage building is proposed doesn't have a restriction on how many boats and trailers you can park in there. It's really what you can fit in there. Uh, so we're narrowing that down to only 10 boat trailer parking spaces, which uh, is a significant decrease on conflicts with the road, as well as some of the traffic that's going out past the Conimac residents. Um, the other thing that was talked about was the infilling of the channel, and there was a couple of graphics that were brought up on the screen. Uh, if, you, if you spend as much time doing aerial research as I do, the first thing that you noticed was that the aerial photographs were from two different years. And having done work in this uh, type of business for many, many years, every aerial photograph that's taken of Lee County has different levels of water clarity. And so while one year you may see what looks like just sort of the same kind of water uh, uh, condition, the next year, when the next round of aerials are flown, we might have picked a time when the water clarity was very good. The graphic you see up on the wall shows what the water clarity was when they flew these aerials was very, very good. So while before you may not have seen a sandbar at all, all of a sudden you do see a sandbar because of a change in the aerial photograph. So I want you to be aware of that when you're looking at those aerial comparisons. The reality is that you don't know what's filling in unless you actually survey it, unless you actually measure the water depths and compare what the previous water depths were to, to make that determination. Uh, I know Roberts Development Corporation has already dredged that channel one time coming in off of the intercoastal waterway to the site. I was involved in that project. That was done at their expense, of which many of the Conimac residents that have boats benefited from at no cost to them. We have not received any complaints from any of the boaters coming in and out to the marina indicating that they're running aground. So uh, whether we've got an issue with shallowing, uh, I would state that that's probably not the case. Otherwise, Mr. Roberts would be calling me, asking me to do the surveys to figure out if we need to dredge it again. A couple of items that I wanted to, to finish up with. Um, again, uh, Tyler was pretty uh, explanatory about the design of the dry storage building. Its width is really driven by the size vessels that are for that site and the, and the forklift. And the only way to push the building back to improve the visuals for the residents of Connie Mac would have been to impact the mangrove systems that are on the backside. And that's a wetland impact that I don't think would be warranted when you do the cost of benefit analysis. Um, the one other thing that was talked about, and I want to make sure that the commissioners understand this, is that many of the uh, supporters for the project were talking about boats parking on the side of the road, and want to make that clear that that was related to Punarasa. I launch my boats out of Punarasa on a regular basis, and when it's a big, heavy-duty weekend, there are boats all up and down Summerlin Road that are using the Punarasa boat ramp, which is an indicator that we don't have enough boating access in our community. Uh, so I just want to make sure that you understand that's where that parking's taking, taking place. Um, the uh, uh, supporters, big picture, expanding public access. You know, again, looking at this photograph, when you're looking at locations to expand marina facilities, it's all about location, location, location. And it's unfortunate that the Connie Mac residents are, have to drive through a commercial marina to get to their, uh, their community However, that's akin to moving in next to an airport and then when the airport proposes an expansion, complaining about the noise. Uh, there's, a, there's this balancing that's got to take place and there's going to be give and take on both sides. And it's my opinion that our side has given a lot to try and accommodate the demand for the boating access that exists here. Uh, and that's really is what this is, is an, is an issue of increasing public access to the water. And that this is the clearest example of trying to meet demand in a location where expansion is consistent with the, the comprehensive plan, the LEAP plan. So I don't know what else we can offer uh, relative to the confines we have for the site. It's not a nice, easy, square parcel to develop on, um, but it's got great boating access. 
and it's got great land access. And that's really important in order for a marina facility to survive and to service the general public, which is what this really comes down to in terms of getting people out to the water uh, that don't have the privilege of living on the water. So that's all I have. Thank you. Up can have anything else? Thank you. Commissioners? Thoughts? Consideration? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'll, um, I guess I'll kick things off then, and we'll get a motion on the floor so that we can have discussion and, and uh, open to hearing the board discussion. Um, so after three and a half years, as was mentioned by everybody who came, uh, and, and now the fourth time for us hearing this, um, I, I want to start with just gratitude for everyone who's been part of this process. Um, gratitude for the residents who I have tremendous admiration for. Uh, you all should teach a class on how to come and talk before the commissioners because you come with uh, wonderful points that uh, are based in evidence that are really well thought out. And, and, and I can't thank you enough for how you've helped us get through this process. Uh, I think after three and a half years and, uh, and now multiple rounds of modifications, uh, we have something that is much better than what was originally submitted. Uh, it's, it's certainly not perfect, and I don't know that we'll ever reach perfection. Um, for the folks on the property owner side, uh, again, I, I actually want to say thank you for being responsive to every request that the board has, uh, has sent to you and uh, has asked you to to go over, you know, when we first started, it was about the road crossing, and then we got into the parking issues and some of the other things, and it, it really does appear that uh, there have been many, many attempts to be very responsive to what the board has requested as well. Um, so with that, uh, my motion would be to um, approve the staff recommendation for today um, with direction to our county department of transportation uh, to add no parking signs along the side of Port Comfort Road uh, to try and kind of also put one final notice or, you know, important notice that we don't want to see that, that parking along the side of the road. And that, that would be my motion, Mr. Chairman. Using the resolution presented by Ms. Grady. Exactly, as suggested by our county attorney. Yeah. Motion on the floor. Second. Second. Discussion? Um, I'll reiterate a few things which I think everybody brought up. One is the fact that I appreciate the work from both sides. Uh, we were always seeking a balance, and I thought it was a very thoughtful process, but it has been a long time, three and a half years or so plus. Um, the question of a hotel there, you know, was, I think that was taken off a long time ago, and I think that was the right decision. The incompatibility there uh, made no sense and stuff like that. So we're really talking about an expansion of the existing use, which we talked about today. Um, there's no question of the need, you know, for water access and boating and stuff like that. And that's an industry that is very important, you know, to our community, uh, for the people that work there and support it and stuff like this. So, uh, again, it's a balance. Um, what I liked also is when people talk about this operation, they talk about a very well-balanced and a very well-run operation. I'm not of ink to, uh, to support businesses that aren't run well. They've done this the right way, and I think they should be rewarded for that, you know, for compatibility. And the last thing is, I, I went back, I'm a real estate guy by trade, I went back and looked at uh, the home appreciations on the island, you know, and, and the homes, beautiful homes, continue to appreciate. So uh, it's a well-desired community. Uh, it certainly has been impacted to date by the use next door, and I think so that that's, again, looking for the value of the homes, and the impact people will have, and, and the compatible use. So. I'd just like to kind of relate to what Commissioner Hammond said. So thank you to both sides. Thank you for doing business Lee County and for the voters and the business owners and for the residents. Um, it's been a three and a half year, probably a long, longer battle because you know this was something was coming years ago. Um, so thank you for both sides for your patience and everything. Um, like Commissioner Hammond said, this is better than what we started with three years ago. Um, it may not be perfect. Um, we're in a position, though, legally, where we have to respond to the magistrate's um, request. Um, we're pretty much almost out of options here as far as the board goes. Um, so I, hopefully 
the residents will walk away and feel like they were satisfied. There was a win for them, and hopefully the business owner will walk away, and the Roberts will come back and say, it was a win for us. We're going to do business. We're going to be a good neighbor for Lee County and good for, neighbor for the Johnson Harbor. So um, we'll see how the vote goes. Thank you. No comments. Thank you. Um, you know, obviously, as the newest person here, I commend all of you for the three years and the constant changes you all made. You continue to try to address the issues, and both sides have been great in doing so. Um, I knew sitting up here, but certainly have sat in uh, a, a former capacity and certainly been through a lot of zoning uh, hearings to say, I um, haven't done this for 14 years. I really do acknowledge that this is a mariner. The compatibility was addressed from the expansion. I like the necessary changes that were made, and I continue to give great gratitude to you all because staff consistently gave approvals and you continue to listen and make modifications and make the necessary adjustments so i am certainly uh, uh gra grateful for all you've done and uh it was great reading and trying to get up to speed on this uh three and a half years that have been going on but um, i'm certainly supportive of this you missed all the fun <laughs> <laughs> So we have a motion, we have a second, uh, we've had discussion. Uh, any objection? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned, thank you all.